Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 4th of August and we have a nice honey pot full of Azure goodness today. As always, I have the chapters so you can jump to the particular update. A new videos this week. So I dived into the new application gateway for containers. Now, although the name application gateway is familiar, that's really the only familiar part of this solution. It's completely created from the ground up, specifically for our Kubernetes workloads in Azure. And so I go into all of the details about how it works, how we can leverage it. And then a video about one approach to bulk enabling service health alerts for all of the subscriptions in your organization. Depending on how we do permissions, RBAC, tagging, there's different ways we can achieve this. But if we're not getting our subscription owners to sign up for these alerts themselves, well, some approaches to bulk get them on board. So new updates on the compute side, the Container Insights cost customization has gone GA. Remember the way the insight technologies work is it's a curated set of knowledge and insight and advice by the different product groups, but it works by sending metrics telemetry to a log analytics workspace. Well, that ingestion is money. And so what this customization lets me do is two things. I can control which sets of data tables get populated so I could turn particular ones off, for example, maybe certain types of inventory, certain types of events, but I can also change the timing between one and 30 minutes. Now, obviously, if I start turning off certain sets of data, that's gonna limit the information available to insights, it might limit the features available. If I change how frequently it sends the data, well, that loses some fidelity of the information, but I'll still get a certain amount of benefit and it will enable me to optimize my cost. And then Azure Site Recovery for shared disks. So one of the things we can do for managed disks is depending on the exact SKU, I can connect to it from multiple virtual machines. This is really useful for certain types of cluster scenarios where they'll see it as a shared disk and I can then use that within a cluster scenario. So now I can protect and replicate shared disks as part of Azure Site Recovery in Preview. And then JBoss EAP on app service clustering is now GA. So basically now the JBoss EAP will just automatically start as a clustered service, which is gonna give me um, better efficiency and high availability. So that's also gonna auto scale as part of the app service. On the networking side, so App Gateway TLS defaults are updated. So what this now says is that I think the minimum TLS version is now 1.2 up to TLS 1.3. And it's also got stronger Cypher suites protected. So that's obviously gonna give us higher sets of security. The next generation firewall uh, Palo Alto Azure native ISV service is now GA. So this is actually the first ISV next generation firewall service that's been natively integrated with Azure. So it's a collaboration between Microsoft and Palo Alto Networks. It's using things like AI and machine learning behind the scenes to detect and stop known, unknown, zero day types of exploits. It's available in the marketplace and it is a managed service. And for my administration, I can use the Azure portal or I can use the Palo Alto Panorama Policy Management Solution. So I can use my existing knowledge and administration tools or I can go and use the Azure portal. And I can use it in both a regular virtual network but also my virtual WAN hub. So I, I can take advantage of it in multiple services in Azure. And then Route Server now has the hub routing preference, remember, Route server is all about, hey, I can now learn BGP routes from other NVAs, for example, in my environment, rather than having to rely on user-defined routes. But what if in a scenario of branch to branch, I learn multiple routes across Express Route, across um, site-to-site VPN, across maybe some other SD-WAN solution? 
and I wanna be able to customize what's the preference for that. Now it's always gonna prefer routes with the longest prefix match. I, if I have multiple um, different paths and one of them is a slash uh, I don't know, 28 and one of them is a slash 20 or the slash 28 is more specific, it will always prefer that. But after that, we can then pick well, what's our preference. So express route will be the default preference but I could change that if I wanted to be site site VPN or an NVA or shortest AS path. Remember AS path is all about well, how many different sets of autonomous systems do I have to traverse to get somewhere? So the smaller number of those, we generally consider it the shortest path to get there. But now I can configure that routing preference to be express route, VPN, SD-WAN or AS path. On the storage side, so zone redundant storage for managed disks is now available in East Asia. So that's where my three copies are distributed over the three availability zones in the region. And then Azure NetApp Files SMB continuous availability has gone GA. So this is leveraging the transparent failover feature of SMB 3.0 and above. And really what it's doing is, assuming there are multiple servers that are hosting a certain service, if I'm the client, and I have my file handle, well that file handle is now persistent. So if the particular server I was talking to goes away because of a problem or maintenance, I can go and now connect to another server that's offering the same share, and the state of now that persistent file share will be maintained, and I, I don't lose progress, I don't lose the state of that file handle. On the database side, so Postgres SQL major version upgrade has gone GA. So this obviously is Postgres flexible. The whole point of this is now I can move to a higher version without a complicated migration process, having to stand up a new one and move stuff over. It does run a pre-check, assuming that's okay. Then it takes, a, I think, a, a native little backup, uses PG upgrade to actually perform the in-place upgrade to a new version. It is an offline operation. Typically, I think now, obviously, if I think I had a huge database, but typically it's a 15 minutes should be the downtime associated. It supports high availability, but it does not support read replicas. So if I have read replicas, I'll need to remove them first, do the upgrade, and then add the read replicas back afterwards. It does also now support PostgreSQL 15 in GA. And then MySQL Flexible now has auto scale IOPS. So what this gives me is the IOPS on demand. I don't have to now think of, well, what's the max I'm gonna need and pre-provision it and pay for it even when I'm not using all of it. Instead, I'll only now pay for the amount I actually need. So I'm gonna avoid unnecessary provisioning and expense, which would maybe for potential long periods of time be underutilized. Cosmos DB now has intra account, so within the account copy for the MongoDB API as well now. So this is all about the idea that, hey, I want to contain a copy job to copy from one collection to another within the same Cosmos DB account. That's now available using the MongoDB API. And then SQL Database and SQL Managed Instance now has TDS 8.0 in preview. So TDS is the tabular data stream, and it's the protocol that's an application layer, and it's used from the client to connect to the SQL server. Now what TDS 8.0 does is that TDS session is actually wrapped in a TLS session. So the TLS session is established first, and then the TDS goes inside that nice TLS envelope. What that means is I cannot disable that encryption and it's always encrypted. So now that's in preview. There's also some new failover SQL managed instance writes. And what this really boils down to is if my SQL managed instance is used as a passive disaster recovery site. Um, so for SQL Server 2022, for software assurance or pay as you go, I have those new failover writes in that passive scenario. And also now SQL database and SQL managed instance have XML compression. So XML is very, very common to structure and store information. The challenge with XML is it's pretty verbose. There's a lot of the, the, the tags and all that information, which means it's a lot of storage, 
So both capacity I have to have, and then when I query it, a lot of data to return. So compression can help reduce that amount of data, which then means I'm storing less, I need less capacity, but also it will improve the performance of my queries as less data actually has to be um, fetched. So now that XML compression is available in the database engine, and I'll get those benefits. And SQL Managed Instance Private Link has gone GA. Now, ordinarily, SQL Managed Instance deploys into your virtual network anyway. So I'm using a private IP from my VNet to talk to it. So you might say, well, why would I want a private endpoint? Which the whole point of a private endpoint is it's an IP address from my VNet that talks to a specific instance of a service on the other end that's hosting a PLS. Well, imagine I have a scenario where I want to use this managed instance from another virtual network, but I can't peer or I don't want to peer. Obviously, peering is a fairly broad set of connectivity. Now I can restrict it with NSGs, but there's also a certain amount of knowledge I get about the other network. Well, private link obfuscates a huge amount of that. And it also enables me to say, hey, I just want this particular port exposed. So now if I can't peer, I don't want to peer, I can still get connectivity to a SQL managed instance. And then miscellaneous, so Azure Advisor now has a cost optimization workbook. So this includes things like identifying idle resources, um, improperly deallocated virtual machines, um, using things like hybrid benefit, and it's just in the workbooks gallery of Azure Advisor, so you can go and take a look at that. Azure Load Testing has, I think it's three updates. So I can now run tests with up to 100,000 virtual users emulated that will be enabled by up to 400 engine instances. Now the default quota won't let you run 400, but I can raise a support request to increase the quota of the number of engine instances. I can also now run tests for up to 24 hours, which again will be a support request to increase that duration to 24 hours. And I can also now manage and run tests from the AZ CLI. So there's an AZ load test and an AZ load test run set of commands to manage that now from the AZ CLI. Azure Chaos Studio has some new faults in preview. Now when I say new faults, I don't mean it has new bugs that's gonna cause you problems. It's new faults I can use in my experiments to simulate certain types of real world activities. So one of them is I can stop an app service. So this will basically stop an app service, the functions, API apps, mobile apps for the duration of my fault um, during the experiment. So that can help simulate outages of an app service. And also now I have a network packet loss option for VMs and virtual machine scale sets. So now I can simulate network congestion or network hardware issues with those. And also Chaos Studio is now available in Southeast Asia region. There are some um, cost management updates. So let's see if I can get that to open up. So if we quickly jump over. So there's some new documentation around FinOps. There's some updated around some of the pricing and renames of various services. Um, some feedback opportunities, cost management labs. But as always, I've got the link in the description below. So recommended you, you go and read that and get all of the different information. And there's a new dashboard for Entra Identity Protection. So if I was to jump over super quickly, now mine's pretty boring. So if I was to actually go and look at this dashboard, so over here I'm in entra.microsoft.com and I've gone to my protection and identity protection, we have this new dashboard option. And what this dashboard is showing me, and again, it's not showing me much in my environment, but the whole point is I've got some nice graphics showing where attacks are coming from. I can see the overall attack types, how they've been handled. I can get recommendations. Again, I don't really have any in my environment. So actually if I jump over here, let's use their, uh, their documentation page for a second. It's got much better pictures. You can see, hey, there's really nice pictures of the types of attacks on my tenant, recommendations, uh, that nice map, different types of recent activity. There's some new advanced detections, verified threat actors, which is really cool. Attack in the middle, so someone's done something to 
um, fake a certain logon experience and then use what is a valid um, token. Some new real-time Azure AD threat intelligence, which would work as part of a sign-in risk in my conditional access policies. So just some really nice new features um, all around that. And that is it for this week. As always, I hope this was useful. And until next video, take care.